Welcome to Frankly Speaking. This is a new podcast on responsible business by Frank Bold, the European public interest law firm. I'm Richard Howitt, and after several years of debating these issues inside the European Parliament, I speak frankly and personally about what moves policymakers, business and activists to make responsible business the norm. Today on Frankly Speaking, my guest is Ilko van der Enden, Chief Executive of the Global Reporting Initiative appointed at the start of this year. The GRI was a pioneer and remains the most widely used voluntary frameworks for business sustainability reporting. Used by nearly three quarters of the world's top 250 companies and more than 10,000 businesses in all. Ilko was formerly tax partner at the accountancy firm PwC. He has more than 20 years of experience in financial and sustainability senior management roles and he was called by Forbes magazine ESG's biggest champion. Ilko, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for being with us. Now, first, congratulations. It's a big job, a huge job, Chief Executive of the GRI. Congratulations. I'm sure you're enjoying it. The first question is obvious. It's now about eight months since you started. How is it going? What have been your impressions? What have you been up to? Well, as I told someone yesterday, it feels like 80 years. <laughs> I mean, we are in, the, in, in something like a roller coaster. There is so much happening in the landscape uh, around sustainability reporting and corporate reporting as such, uh, that with all the initiatives, sometimes it's difficult uh, to keep up with the pace. But having said that, that is also exactly why this job is so rewarding and so exciting, because things are happening. And if we only look at, let's call it, the history of financial reporting and uh, the speed with which things have developed over the past 100 years, which was sometimes like a slug space, now, suddenly, when it comes to sustainability reporting, with the introduction of the ISSB, uh, with the introduction of the CSRD in Europe and the work of EFREC, and uh, SDG, you're, do you're doing very well on the alphabet suit, which both you and I exist. So ISSB, International Sustainability Standards Board, uh, CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Now, you, you we're just going to give a third one, but spell it out in full for us. The Stock Exchange Committee in the United States. We uh, see all kind of initiatives there uh, coming with, I would say, the speed of light. And for once, that is very good. That's very positive because they all contribute to getting and focusing attention on what needs to be done to make this a healthier, happier planet for all of us. The downside of this is, of course, that there is so much happening that there are just not enough hours in a day in order to try to cope with everything. So our organization, uh, which has its 25th anniversary this year, has never been at the forefront of so many initiatives in one time as in this moment. So with all the players you say in the alphabet soup, we have very good and very strong relationships. And one reason, of course, being that we are by far the most widely used standards for impact reporting, for sustainability reporting in the world. And let me let me just explain you what our purpose is and why we are what's here. Going, what's going to be the next question? So that's perfect. <laughs> Okay, so now our purpose is that, that, that we enable investors and, and other stakeholders to make decisions on impacts based on facts and not on perceptions. And we do so by providing top quality standards on impact reporting, free and for the public good, so that businesses can provide society with comparable data. That's what we do. And that's what our mission is. And I think we have been quite successful. And with all the, the, the developments now happening and with the indeed incorporation of the ISSB 
as part of the uh, International Financial Reporting Foundations framework, uh, the, the organization that has been responsible also for 25 years for making financial reporting standards. They felt the importance of the sustainability agenda for businesses and investors and see incorporation of this new body that focuses on the financial effects of topics around environment and socioeconomic cohesion. On the other hand, you had the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFREC. And that's the body that makes on behalf of Europe uh, reporting standards also on sustainability. But not only from a financial point of view, no, also from an impact point of view. And what does that mean when you speak about the financial impacts, financial materiality for the reporting entity, for the businesses? It is about outside in. So what are the effects of climate change or social unrest uh, or uh, bad governance on the value creative effects of the reporting entity on its cash flows, on its profitability. That is the outside in. However, what are the effects of a business that is pursuing its strategic objectives on the environment, on climate, on socioeconomic topics in society? So we call that inside out. So if I have a factory and I have a lot of greenhouse gases, how does that impact climate? How does that impact the environment? It is this is that we call the double materiality, the inside out, whereby you also take into account those effects. That's a very lucid description of what is quite rightly, you say, a uh, fast moving speed of light landscape on corporate reporting. So, so thank you for that. Can I just probe? Um, on the International Sustainability Standards Board, it was a big moment when the GRI announced a memorandum of understanding. Now, again, there's a lot of governance there, a lot of different committees and technical groups and so on. But at its heart, um, in lay terms, how are you working with the ISSB? I think a lot of the business audience out there would be interested to hear that. I think I can't say it's simpler than we take care of the impact reporting part. We take care of the inside out. That is our mandate, that's what GRI does. So our memorandum of understanding with our friends of the ISSB is basically that we try align as much as we can the ISSB standards with the GRI standards, whereas they clearly take care of the enterprise value creation part and we take care of the impacts part. Then the question is, how do you do that? Well, by first of all, aligning agendas. Secondly, by finding topics whereby some of the definitions the ISSB uses and the GRI uses will be synchronized. So when we speak about biodiversity, that we both mean the same about biodiversity. When we engage in discussing sector or industry standards, that we try to build on exactly the same pattern what we mean by industry A and B or sector A and B. I think that's been a really clear answer. Thank you. I think there are a lot of businesses out there that report according to the GRI, many of whom may be for more than 10 years. And obviously the GRI has gone through various evolutions during that period, but they'll be, they'll know, but perhaps not know in detail about all these different developments. And they'll be wondering how it's going to impact them. So for the companies that are already reporting on GRI, what would be your advice to them? I will make a pledge to them before I give an advice. We at GRI, we represent our purpose, as I always say, and not a legal entity or a foundation. 
So we will do everything that we can to make sure that we will see that there is this global baseline on corporate reporting, both for financial as impact purposes. So we cooperate both with the ISSB and with Europe in the FRAC in order to see that we align these initiatives as much as we can. So what does that mean? We have this very good relationship with ISSB. We have this very good relationship with FRAC, which nearly by default means that the essence of what GRI is will become the impact reporting structure moving forward. And I dare to say on a global baseline. So keep reporting under GRI standards, because more likely than not, speaking in accounting terms, more likely than not, that is what the framework will be in the future for impact reporting. And you've talked about the European approach and your uh, work with FRAG. Um, they're doing double materiality, including impact reporting. You're doing impact reporting. There obviously could be a divergence between those. How, how would that be handled? Yeah. So currently there is. Uh, and we have been a co-creator in uh, the first set of draft standards by EFREC. To put it bluntly, the current European standards when it comes to the impact part on reporting is covered for 60% by the GRI standards. And we know, of course, that within EFREC, people are processing all the information. And I expect them to increase this percentage uh, of compatibility with GRI standards. In the end, it has to be seen what it exactly will be, but it would be not very wise to deviate from a proof of concept that's already there for 25 years. What my expectations is, is that we will see the EU exposure drafts uh, absorbing some of the comments on which I assume that parts of the deviations between the current GRI standards and the EFREC standards uh, will be remedied. And of course, the European uh, Standards Reporting Standards Board is looking at all of those comments now, and uh, we're expecting the, new, the uh, new draft standards to be published in November. So, so definitely watch this space. Back to the ISSB, and thank you, listeners, for staying with us. Uh, uh, but it's fascinating to see how this landscape is changing, and that's something I've had you and I, I share. GRI obviously covers not just environment, but social standards, human rights. It, it, it goes across the impacts of the company. The ISSB has chosen to start with climate first and is, is now deliberating about where it goes next. I'm guessing that you're a voice and the GRI is a voice for them to, to look comprehensively across the ESG spectrum. Am I right? Yes, you are. Let me give you an example there. And all these topics in, in, in these three letters, E, S, and G, they are all interconnected. And they are also all interdependent. So climate change has an effect on social topics like human rights and happiness, has an effect on governance. Um, decisions we make on, on climate will affect the way how we live and how we operate. When we see what's happening in local coal mining industries, for example, in the United States, it is very easy to say we have to close down a coal mine because it's bad for the environment. But by closing in a local community, the biggest employer there is will trigger a lot of human suffering. So closing something down on behalf of the environment without taking into account what the human aspects and consequences are of decisions like that 
will create different problems. So all these issues are interconnected. I mentioned at the beginning, you were a tax partner, you're a tax specialist before you came to uh, GRI, although in fact you contributed to the GRI's own tax standard. I think many of our listeners would really agree with you that ESG issues are interconnected and interdependent, but they would wonder where tax fits into that. Does it fit into that? Yes, it fits in uh, uh, in the S of social, but also in G of governance and also in the E of environmental. Some say that it tells you something about the level of civilization. Um, why is tax important? Tax is important because it's not only used to, to generate revenue for states, it's also there to influence behavior and also to redistribute wealth in a certain way. Uh, Let's start with the last one. So we have progressive uh, income tax systems uh, so that people that can afford more pay more. So when it comes to influencing behavior, uh, we see, for example, energy taxes. Uh, you tax polluting stuff more than things that are more sustainable or you tax things that are bad for people, tobacco, alcohol, more than et cetera. And of course, states need to, to have the funds and the means in order to enable them to do what they have to do to create socio-economic cohesion in the society. That's why tax is always a political issue. That's why no one can close his eyes and just say, okay, guys, listen, uh, uh, my strategy is to optimize uh, the bottom line of my organization by paying as less tax as I can, which is a legitimate legal objective. But then you step into what I call the neoliberal tax trap. If you are a business, you need a proper infrastructure, both from an educational as well as a uh, transport, uh, uh, from a transport point of view. If you do not have educated people, if you cannot transfer your projects, if the energy uh, sources are, are not of a good quality, then you will not be able to run a successful business. And you cannot run a successful business in a dysfunctional society. And whether we like it or not, taxes are necessary in order to create a successful society. The issue is, of course, that we all have different ideas on when we think a society is successful. And that has been built up in history on a cultural basis. So in a more... Uh, let's call it social oriented state as France, it is far more that governments are, are being expected to provide a schooling system that's accessible for all at very low cost, that you have a health system that is very advanced and free. Whereas in some countries, it's more a pay as you go system, which is perfectly fine if that's the cultural fit on what society is built on and you enable people indeed to make those free choices so there is not a wrong or right there is just a different cultural appreciation on how a state should function and that tells you a lot about the tax system that fits within that environment and tax transparency of course is then how businesses negotiate that and um, you know I would certainly advise people to look at the GRI's tax reporting standard. Time is moving on okay it's very enjoyable talking with you. You know I wanted to talk to you about the sustainability contacts principle this idea that there's only a, a fixed case cake which should be sliced up. Businesses need to know what they should do in order to meet global goals like the 1.5 degrees threshold. The sustainability context principle has been at the heart of the GRI since you started. It was strengthened in your universal standards. But some people question you about why uh, you don't yet insist on allocations, that there, there should be specific figures that companies should be able to report against and performance, that they have to report their own performance in relation to sustainability context. Are those questions with you coming into your role that you're interested in and we 
we'd expect to see more from the GRI in the years to come? You will see more of the GRI in the years to come. But these are very difficult topics. We are foremost and for all a standard setter. There are a lot of people asking us a lot of questions that also go more into the moral debate and the boardroom business decision debate on where to push organizations to on what they must or should do. At this moment in time, we just can't because we are not the ones to set the targets for businesses and we are not the ones to enforce organizations to use our standards. We are a voluntary standard. We are no regulators. We support and we advise uh, for various reasons, organizations to use our standards and we more than happily are to support and engage them with this. But we are not the organizations that will explain them what they should do in order to achieve their objectives around the sustainable development goals or others. We're running short of time, Elko, and you have been prepared to talk about some very big picture ideas, including neoliberalism and morality. So thank you for that. I, I want to ask you a big picture question. Add on 10 or 20 years. You're a new chief executive, I've been a chief executive. You have to bring leadership and vision to your role. I'm sure that you are and you will. What is your vision adding on 10 and 20 years on what corporate reporting, corporate sustainability reporting, sustainable business will look like? Impact reporting and financial reporting will be of equal importance and therefore also equally treated as such. That means that you will see full assurance on both financial as on impact reports because they do matter. I think and I believe that when it comes to getting the best results for your investors, you have to take care of society as a whole because you cannot have a successful, profitable business in an unsuccessful society. And I think that our standards and impact reporting can help achieving that. Because through transparency and reporting, you will see a changing behavior. And that is not only by businesses or executives, but also by the appreciation of society itself on how businesses operate. We need to rebalance and we need to revitalize the fine art of compromise again, which is also, I think, at the basis of this two-pillar strategy whereby financial reporting and impact reporting are of equal importance. The short-termism and winner-takes-it-all mentality is, in the end, helping no one. So I hope that my legacy is that I can build a platform or co-create a platform with our organization where these two pillars will indeed will become commonplace and again of equal importance with the assurance it needs in the very near future. Brilliant. And it's probably a bit early, okay, to talk about your legacy because uh, you're embarking on a journey at GRI, uh, but it's one that many of our listeners, and frankly speaking, will be uh, not just thanking you for engaging with us today, but also wishing you the very, very well and very good luck with all those endeavours and with that vision in the months and the years to come. Sadly, we've come to the end of our podcast. We would like to invite all our audience to send us your feedback to frankly speaking at frankbold.org and to share our conversation. You've been listening to Frankly Speaking, the Frank Bold podcast on responsible business. Watch out for our next episode and find out about Frank Pold's Responsible Companies section on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I'm Richard Howitt. Thank you again to Elko and to all our listeners, and goodbye.